So we are talking about uh, eschatology. What is Woo. eschatology? There you go. We got one fan of this. Labor Day weekend, all right? Eschatology is the study of last things, okay? So we see this. It means that it's literally the study of end times, including death and afterlife. It's about uh, studying judgment and heaven and hell. All good stuff on Labor Day. Who's with me, all right? <laughs> it's also about Jesus' second coming, all right? And one of the challenges with this church is that we preach through the Bible. Sometimes we'll do some topical sermons, we do, but we usually teach through a book, which means that we're through a book a long time. We've been in the way of of Jesus and the book of Mark for a very long time. We're on a long journey, but it also means that we have to talk about things. We can't jump around and skip what we don't want to talk about, all right? So it's Labor Day weekend, and we're talking about the end times, all right? We've been on a long journey, but we are studying the way of Jesus. And everything comes up, and today we're in Mark 13. So if you want to pull out your phones, pull out your Bible, we are in Mark 13. And we're going to see that Jesus has some words for us on how we are to live, okay? And we are practicing the way of Jesus, so we listen to Jesus' words on what he has to say, because he has words that are going to shape us on how we are to live. He's going to guide us as things get tougher on how we're supposed to live. Now, I want to make this note. We're going to be in Mark 13. We're going to stick in Mark, Mark 13. This is not an a, uh, a exhaustive look at the end times, okay? We're looking at Jesus' words in Mark 13. Now, have you ever been river rafting? Raise your hand if you've ever been white rod river. Whoa, sweet. You guys know what's up. All right, I got a lot. You know that it's a fun ride, okay? You know that it's fun. There's fun rapids, and there's serious rapids. You know what I'm talking about? There's some that the hippie guy that's standing behind, that's sitting behind you, that you were like, I paid you a hundred bucks and I don't even know if you finished high school kind of thing, you know? But he's like just having a great time. And we remember the first time I went, I went up and uh, there was a guy who uh, led me in West Virginia. It was the first time I rode my rapids. And there, the first rapid, we go through two rapids and he looks up. And he looks up into the, the mountains and he says, do you see that little uh, tent up there? He said, yeah. He said, that's where I live. And I thought, oh, no, we're in trouble. This guy is ready for us to have a fun time. And you know that the guide is like this. When it's fun rapids, they're fun and they're light. They're having a good time. And then you come up to a rapid and it's like a class four or a class five. And the dude instantly gets serious. And he's like, you're going to paddle hard on the right side. you got to move in. you got to paddle. And when you fall out here, you're basically dead. And you know all this kind of stuff, right? You know that when you go white rod rafting. Well, what I want to say is that I was thinking about this. Sometimes it can be just as intimidating to talk about the end times. And what you see is that in the Bible, there are these things that you see. And there's these rocks and there's some rapids. And you know what you can know. But underneath the river is what you don't know, okay? And that's the stuff that God knows. And there's so much going on underneath that we do not know, okay? So I want to put that out there, okay? Because you're about to go into like a class four or class five rapid maybe. (laughs) Now I want to say this. In times and prophecy, you can't know everything no matter how much you want. And what we see is Jesus tells us himself, Mark 13, 32, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So here's what I'm going to say. Take the pressure off yourself right now. Take the pressure off yourself right now, okay? And let's focus on Jesus because he's going to say, this is how you are to live. The pressure on us is now because of this, this is how we live, okay? Is everyone on the same page? Still rocking with me? Because we're focusing on Mark 13. Well, let's go to Mark 13, 1. Now, if you knew this, we are right before the crucifixion. We are in the days leading to the crucifixion, and Jesus has been spending his time in the temple. He's been doing two things. He's been teaching, and he's been getting in some fights with religious leaders, if you remember, right? And he's probably spending the nights on the Mount of Olives. And so we see this, Mark 13, 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. The temple in Jesus' day was an architectural marvel. It makes the People's Plaza 
nothing compared to what that was, all right? As we, we hang drywall, we're not hanging, putting stones like this, all right? And we know that the first temple was by King Solomon, right, in 957 B.C., and it was destroyed 400 years later by the king of Babylon. And so we're looking at the second temple, and they're on the hillside, and they're looking at this temple, okay? And we know that they're looking at the second temple, which is Herod's temple, and Herod had massive building projects. This is what he was known for. He was extravagant, okay? And so this temple was next level. And it says this, that, 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 that the, the stones, it was believed that they're 37 feet long, 12 feet high, and 18 feet wide. So when they see this, they're looking at a monument of all the strength and the power and achievement that could be mustered by humankind, all right? They're looking at this. Keep in mind, this is 2,000 years ago, and they're looking at this marvel, and they would be amazed. Now, it also is important to point out, because it's going to make sense the rest, there is a permanence to this building. If we saw this building today, many buildings that we see today, we're like, that's going to be there forever. And for the Jewish people, nothing was more magnificent and nothing was more formidable than the temple. And so they're in awe as they see the power of this. So that's why it's so shocking when Jesus replies like this, Mark 13, two through four. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished, all right? They're, on the, they're across the valley. They're sitting there. He's got their inner circle. We talked about this, plus Andrew. And the logical question comes out. It's like, Jesus, what you said was kind of a big deal, all right? Let's not move past it. Now, here's what I want to know. When is this going to go down, and how will we know when this is happening? Logical question. These are the questions that we have, too. When we think about Jesus' second coming, when we think about the end times, we have when is this coming and what's going to be happening when it happens, right? These are the questions that we have. And Jesus is going to answer their question and not answer their question and give them a lot more. This is a very Jesus move, all right? He's going to give them a lot more. And he's going to teach them. And he's, Jesus is going to start with this question, but he's going to go deeper. And he discusses what is going to happen. Now, it's important to note, when you're reading this next section, again, sorry, this is a lot of teaching, but I think it's important. That when reading this next session, Jesus is going to follow the path of the Old Testament Hebrew prophets, okay? Now, what is that path? They were often sharing about near future events and far off future events at the same time. They had the ability to live within that. They were going to point to near future events. And what they were doing is saying, this is going to foreshadow a future event, okay? And so Jesus is operating in that role, and he's talking about both. This is where this gets confusing. If you read this by yourself and not studied it, it gets confusing because he's going to pop in and out of that two, those two things. He's going to talk about the near future. In the near horizon, there actually is going to be the, 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 the temple is going to be destroyed, okay? So that's going to happen. This marvelous temple that they are sitting on the hillside looking at that, again, has complete permanence. In AD 70, the Romans destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. They take it all down, all the stone, because they want the gold. It's all gone. This really did happen. And at the same time, he's going to bounce around. He's going to talk about a distant future. And sometimes this back and forth is going to get confusing, or confusing okay? So what are his words for us? Jesus is first going to let us know this whole next section is all about things will get tough, okay? Again, wish I had better news, but things will get tough. We speak the truth here, okay? Things will get tough. And as things get tough, he actually gives us instructions. We can get so obsessed 
with when is this going to happen and what is this going to look like that we completely miss that Jesus gives us exact words on how we are supposed to act within this. But it is going to get tough because there's a clear call on how we are supposed to act in the midst of challenges and suffering. And the statements are fun statements. They're like this. See that you do not and how you're supposed to be, okay? So these are direct commands to you, okay? And I don't think these statements are meant to cause you anxiety or scare you because when we talk about this stuff, there's a natural anxiety that can come up. Instead, he's inspiring you to wisdom, he's inspiring you to courage, and he's inspiring you to this, perseverance, which we're gonna talk about, okay? Perseverance. Because Christians, we live with the end in mind. So Mark 13, 5 through 6, and Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. The first one's like this. Watch out. Be on guard for messianic impostures, okay? There will be false messiahs that come up. And he said, they're literally going to say, I am he. They're literally going to say, I am the person, okay? And in the near future, the disciples would have seen this, okay? Several messianic uh, impostors came up and rose up right before the temple was destroyed. And we see this throughout history, okay? Now, here's the tough part. There is a natural anxiousness that we all have for Christ's return, okay? And we think maybe this would never happen to us, because, but there is anxiety and there is frightfulness that can come up in this whole area. There's like this desire so much to know it, right? And people can get frightened and they can be so easily, so easily put, led astray by charismatic impostors. Really can't happen. Look, if someone is trying to convince you that he or she is Jesus, he or she is not Jesus, okay? We have, clear, we have clear guidelines on how this is gonna go down, okay? And so it's one of those things, but I also don't wanna make light of it because people can so easily get led astray by their anxiety, by their fright, by their, their nervousness, whatever it is, and we see it, all right? So we watch out, we be on guard. All right, now let's see this. He says, do not follow because things are going to get tough. Mark 13, 7 through 8. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. So there will be a few things that you're going to hear about, all right? There's going to be conflicts and rumors of conflicts. There's going to be nation against nation. It's going to be kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be seismic activity that's happening around the world. And there's going to be food shortage. And when that happens, Jesus tells us how to act. But this is where we get it so wrong as believers, okay? He doesn't tell you to freak out. Our natural is to freak out out, all right? Everyone's natural is to freak out. He says, do not be alarmed. Do not be frightened. Jesus is warning his disciples against misinterpreting contemporary events and that the end is not at hand, okay? Now, why would he do this? Disciples, you are not to be alarmed, okay? Why are you not to be alarmed? Because we still have work to do. Does that make sense? We're still in the fight. It does not change anything for us, okay? Because we still need to share the love of Jesus with everyone that we come across, all right? Now, frightened, alarmed people have trouble doing that. But we have work to do. Whether it's close at home or far away, we are to respond like this. Don't be alarmed. They all fall on God's sovereign purpose. I know that's a really hard thing to get your head around. It really is. But we live in this whole narrative that it's God's sovereign, sovereignty. And also, at the same time, it's all consequences of sin and rebellion that we are experiencing here on earth, okay? But in the end, God is going to establish his kingdom here on earth. That is going to happen. He's going to establish his kingdom. And he didn't want his disciples 
to wildly speculate about the end times and completely miss it, okay? Instead, he wants to reassure them and us, troubled times are going to happen, but it's not defensive strategies that we take. It's actually offensive strategies that we take. Does that make sense? We so often will hear of these things and we'll think about me first and we're going to hunker down and we're going we're gonna to cower down. We're going to make the, the world's getting too scary of a place. And he's like, we don't want defensive strategies. We want offensive strategies, okay? God is still in control. Can I get an amen? Because these things are going to happen and people are going to freak out. They are. And we don't join them in freaking out. Instead, we show them what it means to not be freaked out, which is mean Jesus is on the throne. And he emphasizes a couple things. The end is still to come, and all these things are the beginning of birth pains, all right? Each generation is going to have their own wars and natural disasters, and these events fall in God's purposes, and they are birth pains. We're experiencing birth pains right now. What does that mean, all right? The end is really just the beginning. For the rest of the world, the end feels like the end. But for us as believers, the end is just the beginning, all right? They're birth pains. Human history is heading not to the end, but it's actually heading to a new birth. Mark 13, 9 through 13, but be on guard. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brothers will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by by all for my name's sake but the one who endures will to the end will be saved jesus is repeated has repeatedly prepared his disciples for this this is clear that he's he's prepared his disciples discipleship involves suffering. Again, not a very good sales point here, the thing, but I want to prepare the people for what the truth is. Discipleship involves suffering. It does, all right? And he tells them to be aware because one hardship they're going to face is they're going to be delivered over to religious authorities and to civil authorities. This is going to happen. And this is a near future sense and a far future sense. This is happening both ways. We know this with the disciples. Look at the book of Acts. They all were facing this, okay? But we also see this throughout history. And to this day, today, as we sit here, and maybe it's a little cold in this room, maybe it's a little hot in this room, maybe you didn't like the music, maybe the lights are too bright. Right now, there are brothers and sisters in Christ that are, race, that are facing religious persecution and facing civil and religious authorities that might be put to death or put in jail. I had the pleasure of working for many years in international ministry, and I see people, one of my dear friends, who literally is going into a closed context and has to wipe all of their, their, their uh, equipment, all their iPhone and their computer and everything because they're going to share the gospel and they're acting like they're going to share something else. There are people that are putting their life at risk that are facing real persecution on this, all right? So we pray for them. And he's going to tell us how we are to act because we are to courageously share the gospel, okay? So he tells us to act like this. He says, don't be anxious about it. Don't be anxious about it. This is a huge, important note for us believers. It's a huge promise. He's saying those who believe, those who believe have the Holy Spirit in them, all right? So don't be anxious. Don't be anxious on what you're going to say. When we have the opportunity to testify to others about Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit to guide our words, all right? Now, one of the things I want to share on this, because it's, I, I don't know how to share it lightly, so I'm just going to say it. Many of us are overwhelmed and intimidated, and we don't feel good enough. We don't feel smart enough. We don't feel articulate enough. I'm your pastor. I'm telling you, I'm not smart enough, and I'm not articulate enough either. It's the Holy Spirit working through us. 
Now, one of the challenges with it, if we feel this way about sharing it with just people on the street, if we're ever faced to share and testify Jesus Christ in front of religious authorities or civil authorities, how are we going to act? We're not anxious about it ever. Instead, we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us to testify on who Jesus is. You are called, listen, you are called to be faithful, you are called to be courageous, and you are called to be dependent. Isn't that weird? You're called to be courageous. You're called to be faithful, but you're also called to be dependent, dependent on the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to give you the words. Now I'm going to power through the next section because there's a lot, a lot going on, and we have too much going on, so I'm going to have limited uh, commentary. Study, study this stuff for yourself. I'm, I'm dead serious. Mark 13, 14 through 27, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand this, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect, but be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. The end is coming, okay? It is. And again, he's going to move back and forth here. The future events, near future events, and future events, all right? This is a demol- There is a, uh, a ending of the city of Jerusalem and, and a demol- demolish of the temple, okay? And so this is, going to ha- this is going to happen, okay? And so we see that. And so he's giving them a field guide for what to do if a foreign invasion happens, okay? Like you're going to flee. It's going to be so bad. But in the same time, it's, it's, it's a future event of what's going to happen as well, all right? Jesus was crucified, okay? He was buried. He ascended to heaven. And now we find ourselves in between, all right? Until he returns, we find ourselves in between, and he's a, before, until he comes back and he establishes his kingdom and his people, and Jesus is going to return, and it's certain, okay? And with that, we should be cheering our heads off, all right? He's coming back. The promise is there. He's coming back on the clouds with power and glory, and because of that, How are we to live no matter what we go through, no matter what hardship we face, no matter what happens, we now live as people of hope, okay? We live as people of hope. And throughout this long teaching, Jesus has told us already to be watchful, to be on guard, to not be alarmed, not be anxious. You cannot do all that, okay? You cannot do all that on your own. We only do that because there is hope that Jesus is coming back. Without hope, you cannot do that, okay? Now, I want to make this point. In the last section, there is a line that I, that I read through, but I didn't uh, really look at, all right? And that's, it gives us insight into how we're supposed to live. Mark 13, 13, let's throw that up. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. I'll read that again. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. All these things are going to happen, okay? Jesus is laying out what is going to happen. It's like rapids. We can see some of them, and there's a lot more going on underneath that we do not know. 
But the truth is that this is going to happen. Now, here's the truth. All these things are going to happen, and it's those who persevere. It's those with endurance. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Perseverance and endurance is part of the game, all right? This is part of the faith that we have. Now, there's a problem, okay? I was a long-distance runner. I ran in high school and college. Now, one of the things about uh, long distance is that really it's just an endurance game. I had the ability to run faster, longer for an extended period of time in a straight line. That was my skill set, all right? Now, there are skill sports, basketball, maybe hitting a baseball, maybe you could throw the football around, where we started a pickup game, all right? We said, let's go do that. Many of you would do fine with that, okay? You get a little tired after that. If I said, we're all going to go out, and we're going to run 26 miles today. We're going to run a marathon. Half of us would die. The other half of us would want to die, all right? That's truth. That's not true. I'd probably die too. I, to be able to have endurance, had to run a couple times a day. I had to lift. I had to eat healthy. I had to stretch. I had to do calisthenics. I had to do all the things. I could only have endurance to run the race that I needed to by doing the training beforehand, okay? What my fear is, is that many of us it will come to the day and we'll just say, I hope that I act this way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, here's the challenge. We are in a culture that emphasizes pleasure and comfort. I'm just going to lay it out there. Way more than perseverance and endurance. Yeah. You do not get any television commercials at you saying, hey, if you just persevere and endure a little bit more, things are going to go well. It's no, take this pill. No, buy this pillow. No, make sure that you got the right comfort shoes so you can get through the airport or whatever, right? It's all comfort. It is all making your life easier. And Jesus is like, I need perseverance and endurance, okay? Many of us feel entitled to be comfortable, like, it's our God-given right that we are going to be comfortable. Like, we spend so much money on being comfortable. It is actually, I was going to pull up some numbers. I'm not even going to put it out there. It is crazy how much we'll spend on bath salts and robes, right? <laughs> those machines that rub your eyes. Have you seen those? You know who I'm talking to out there. I know several of you have them. And I want one too. <laughs> we'll complain about things getting hard rather than persevering and enduring. Now, here's my challenge to you. You have to be prepared. You have to have endurance. The promise is there. Things are going to get tough. We focus on being alert. We focus on being watchful. We focus on being not anxious. We focus on courage. And we don't want to be caught off guard when the time comes, all right? Now, to have endurance, here's what I want to challenge you. We have to have a deep, slowed-down relationship with Jesus. This church does not manage or hold your guys' relationship with Jesus. We help. We will help. We will teach you the things that you need to be taught. We will come together as community. But if you are not regularly practicing being with Jesus, just loving Jesus, hearing from Jesus, being in the word with Jesus, Jesus is laying this out for his disciples. He's saying, well, I'm warning you, things are going to get tough. And he calls them to endurance, not comfort. Paul lays it out, 1 Thessalonians 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel angel, and, archangel and the tr with a trumpet call, call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, 
We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Because Jesus is coming back, we have hope. And Paul is telling us we can wait. We can persevere, we can face any hardship and trial, we can be non-anxious, we can be courageous, we can be on guard when there is hope. So we encourage one another with this. He's calling us to a life of perseverance, all right? He's calling us to a life of another thing as well. When he comes back, what is he looking for? Because this should concern us all. If we've laid the establishment that Jesus is coming back and he's coming back on the clouds with power and glory, he's coming and looking for something at the same time. What is he looking for? Because it really sums everything up. In Luke 18, we see a parable that brings insight. And he told them a parable to the effect that they, they ought always to pray and not lose heart, all right? So this parable is for you to always pray and for you to not lose heart, all right? So hear that. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down with her continual coming, right? All makes sense. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. That's weird that he says that. And will not give God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily, okay? Amen. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus comes in the clouds with power and glory, will he find faith? on earth. The widow needs justice. The judge has no incentive to help, but she beats him down and he gives it. And he's like, isn't God so much better judge than the unjust judge? He's certain that we will get justice for all that we go through. And when we call on his name, we will be saved. And what is he looking for? He's looking for faith. Jesus is looking for faith. He's coming back and he's looking for faith. Now, here's the warning. We have to go through our lives with an awareness that Jesus is coming back. We live on the in-between. This is one of the hardest things to do. We do live in the in-between. It feels like he's coming back tomorrow, and it also feels like he's never going to come back. It's a weird feeling, right? But we live in the hope. This is part of us, all right? We have an acute awareness and when we live that way, it dictates all that we do. Because Jesus comes, and he's looking for those who endure, who endure. He's looking for those who persevere, but he's looking for faith. Those who have given their whole life over to this, to say, I have complete faith in Jesus Christ, all right? Jesus is coming back, and he's looking for faith. I'll end here, Luke 21. 34 through 36, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. This is hard for me, sorry. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. This section in Luke is, goes right with the section in Mark, right? So this isn't separate. I just pulled the Luke because it's different how he, he talks about it. Perhaps out of all that we talked about, false messiahs, Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines, all this big stuff that's happening. Persecution may be one of the greatest threats to your spiritual well-being 
is the daily temptation and distractions that can so easily take root in your lives. The anxieties of life, the pleasures of life, the things that we can do here on earth that just feel so good today that can keep us so easily from not living as Christ is returning in power and glory. The temptation is to settle. The temptation is to make this your ultimate home. The temptation is to live for you alone. That is probably the greatest threat of our generation right now. Stuff's going to happen. Stuff's going to get terrible. There's, there's challenges that always come up in sin and rebellious world. But Jesus is coming back. But the anxieties of the wor- world and the distractions and the need for comfort and the, the, the joys of this world, which are good to experience, but can make it feel so permanent. And the anxieties of life Many of us, myself included, there can be times where the anxieties of life uh, cup is much more filled than the anticipation that Jesus is returning cup. Do you know what I'm saying? My anxieties of life scale is here and my hope that Jesus is coming back and my hope and faith in Jesus can be like this and Jesus is like, it needs to look like this. It's hard. It's hard. Sometimes those fights that you've had with a significant other, the kids rebelling in some way, the, the, the just wanting to give up and watch Netflix today for the whole day, whatever it is, it can get so permanent that we can miss what Jesus is trying to do. Because you and me, we are to be prayerful and we are to be on watch. And we're called to the persevering life, not the comfortable life. I say this fully wishing that I didn't have to say it. I wish that this wasn't true for my wife and I. I wish this wasn't true for my kids. I wish this wasn't true for you guys as well. I wish that we could just promise wealth and health and all the goodness. Jesus is there for you. Jesus cares about all your needs. But he's saying have a vision of your life that is so much bigger because all this sin and rebellion is messing stuff up. You're experiencing it. You're living in the in-between, but the end is coming and it's a good thing. And it's like birth pains. It's not the end. It's just the beginning of a new birth where everything is made right through Jesus. Don't live with permanence. Look, I don't mean that like you just go live completely free of anything. We have responsibilities. We're called to love one another. We're called to be in community. This alone is hard stuff. But we encourage each other with this. Whenever someone's going through something hard, we say, Jesus is coming back. He died for you. He rose from the dead. He's sitting in heaven on the throne, and he's coming back in power and glory. That can get you through any situation that you are currently going through. And I know many of you are going through really, really, really hard things. So let me end here. Jesus is coming back. Paul laid it out. So now you can have hope. And we love one another well through this. But we also call each other to hope. All right? Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I'm acutely aware that anytime this many people get together, that there are people that are going through it right now. Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would be encouraging them or convicting them in any way that that you desire, Lord, and that we as a body would come together with all those that are going through challenges. But I also say this, in every area that we have a challenge or a struggle or a pain, or a hurt. Lord, that we would be able to persevere, to have endurance, to have hope. 
And Jesus, we are called to pray for your return. So we say, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, know that we are a people, redeemed church, this little church that's going to glorify Jesus, that's going to put you on the throne in your rightful place. And we sit here being faithful, being full of faith for when you return. And it may be in our lifetime, it may not, but we live every day with anticipation that you are returning and that it's your glory and it's your honor and it's your power. So Lord, I pray, fill us with your Holy Spirit today. Fill us with everything that we need to persevere, to share the gospel because you said it needs to advance to all nations, Lord. So right now we're declaring in Lakewood and UP and uh, Tacoma and Spanaway, DuPont, Stillicum, that we are advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the anticipation that you are coming back. Jesus, we thank you for these words in Mark 13. Many of them are confusing. Many of them we have to wrestle with, we have to deal with, we have to just trust that under the rapids that you are in, under, you are in control. Yes. But Lord, we want to stand firm, we want to be on watch, we want to be on guard, we want to be courageous, we want to be non-anxious. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit right now would help us in every aspect of our lives around this. And Lord, that we would live as people of hope. In Jesus' name, amen.